It's really hard to hear you, Jennifer. I don't know how close you are to the phone. You have to have the microphone right up close. Yeah, can you hear me now? Much better. Okay. Thanks. I think I heard Michael on the phone too. Yes, we have Michael as well. How many do we need for a quorum? Yeah, so I'm here. Three for quorum, so we do have three for okay. agencies. In that case, why don't we get started, unless there are any objections. Okay. All right, first uh, rule, uh, anyone for public comment? Seeing no public comment, we'll move on. Uh, election of committee chair. And I'm not exactly sure how, I guess we'll take nominations. Please don't nominate me. I don't think I'll be able to finish out the term if I am. Or in the words of Pat Paulson, if I'm nominated, I will not run, and if elected, I will not serve. Anyone under 50 probably doesn't get that. I'm sorry? Kurt can be the one. Kurt, would you like, would you accept the nomination? If, right now, I would say I'm short-staffed, and so it's difficult. Um, when will be the next meeting? In November, so. And what would be the, like, the monthly time? November, Otherwise, well, I, so we try to do this quarterly. Okay. Yes, if someone nominates me, I would do the anti-poll, because <laughs> I do recognize that one. Nina, is that an official nomination? All right. And then for a vice chair, we have a nomination for a vice chair. It can be you. I'm sorry? You. We'll nominate you. I'll nominate you. Fine. I'll be vice chair. <laughs> you wouldn't be the number one, but number two then. Yeah. All right. Close nominations. Okay. Bless you. Can I get a motion to accept? You have to so move. Yeah. yeah, you do have to move and second. Yeah. Thank you. All right. There we go. How many voting members are there? So there should be Hart, PSGA, PSG. There are five. Yeah. yeah. It's based on the five agencies. So right. as long as three are here, we have a quorum. Right. So uh, who, we're sort of missing uh, right now. We're missing uh, Hart, and we're missing MCAT. Yes, that is correct. They yeah. were supposed to join us on the phone, mm -hmm. William and Ryan. But I so know. okay. Is in Cit Citrus County is not included? Citrus County. Um, not for voting. They're just oh, advisory. Not for voting. They're advisory. Oh, yeah. Oh, I see. Five transit agencies. The five transit agencies. One. Yeah. Correct. Okay. Oh, I see. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, Bob. All right. Moving on to approval of uh, minutes, consent agenda, approval of March 12, 2019, June 11, 2019, committee meeting minutes. Can I get a motion? Motion to, Motion to approve, approve second. Second. Any discussion? No, the March one. Do I have to put up for vote? Can we just say motion passes? Motion passes. Motion passes, thank you. All right, presentation and or action items. We'll go to the T-BARTA Envision 2030 Regional Transit Development Plan update. Uh, Bill Ball from Tyndale Oliver. You want to share the rest of the meeting? You're welcome to. <laughs> and thank you for the nomination and, and support by Klein. You're welcome. Good to see you. See you too. Make sure you get close. I'll answer that. Kurt, are you taking over? <laughs> So to speak. <laughs> Once again, Kurt Schall, PCPT, the new chair. Okay. And I'm Bill Ball with Tyndall Oliver. So hopefully we'll get some more joining us. I know Ben was going to see who was going to sit in for Hart. So I will start. But there's a number of things we're going to cover today. And we'll switch that. Good morning, everyone. Ryan Suarez with Manatee County. Hopefully you can hear me. I'm on the phone now. Yes, we can hear you, Ryan. That's good. Okay, very good. Sorry for being late. No worries. 
Good morning, everyone. Brian in Florida with Manatee County. Hopefully, you can hear me. I'm on the phone now. Very good. Sorry for being late. I'm supposed to say you're now the chair of the committee. Is that okay? <laughs> <laughs> or actually, okay. you nominated Bill Steele to do it. Sounds good. <laughs> okay, so let me get started. Um, I'm going to cover a number of things today that you, you have Good morning, everyone. Brian Porter, Lieutenant County. Hopefully, you can hear me on the phone now. Yeah, you can hear me Somebody. Very good. Sorry for being late. Everybody needs to go on mute that's on the phone, please. So these are the things I'm going to cover today. We're going to talk a little bit about the existing regional transit services. We're going to talk about the regional transit vision network that we've been working on, and we've we've tried to meet with each of the of the communities about that coming into today. We're going to spend a lot of time talking about a performance evaluation that we've conducted so far, which is related to the peer region analysis and the trend analysis, and then we'll give you an update on the public outreach as well. So if you'll recall, we have some existing regional transit services out there today. These are three parts of the region that shows the existing services that either cross county lines or provide connectivity to major regional activity centers. So we have a starting point from which to define regional services in the region. We also, in the report that I believe was provided to you yesterday, a link to that report, there's a lot of information in that report. I, I recognize that you will, will not have looked at it before today, but it's, it's good information about where we are with the project and a lot of what I'm presenting today. So there'll be an opportunity for you to see it today, go back and look at it, and then let us know if you have any comments and questions. Part of that is to educate and define for the board definitions for different types of transit technologies. So we've got three categories of transit technologies that we've identified. The first one being on this slide, bus technologies, the five different types of bus services, most of which are operated in the region today with the exception of bus rapid transit, which we're defining as being in exclusive lanes, and we do not have that yet being operated in, in the region today. The second category is the different rail technologies, again, defining them for the purpose of the board especially. Uh, five different rail technologies as well. We do have the streetcar here in the, in the city of Tampa and including uh, downtown in Ybor, and of course the passenger rail that Amtrak currently operates and potentially future uh, passenger rail coming to the area as well. The third category we've defined as other. This includes like the waterborne services that are being operated seasonally now and potentially could be permanent down the road. Uh, as well as other technologies, including working with transportation network companies and shared ride services. And then new and emerging technologies. One of the key responsibilities of TBARDA or charges is to look at new and emerging technologies as well. And that's part of the funding from the legislature has charged them with doing that. So one of the first things we did was look at the level and quality of the existing regional transit services. To give you an example of that, what we have done here is looked at the morning peak, the level of service in terms of the frequency of service, and we look at that currently, if this, this map shows 60 minutes or faster, meaning it comes by a stop every 60 minutes or faster, and you can see the regional network that we have today at that level of service. If we go to the next one at 50 minutes or better, the red routes disappear and our network gets much smaller if we look at 30 minute service, again, even much smaller, not much of a regional network anymore. We have some routes, mostly uh, uh, at Hillsborough, Pinellas, and one route in Pasco and Manatee. And then if we go down to 15 minute service, we just have a couple of routes left in part of PSDA. Just the point being is that we don't have regional services that are at the level of service that are viable for commuting options at this point. We also, identified a number of specific trips that could be made in the region, regional trips, 
and we wanted to measure the travel time of a transit trip if it were taken with existing transit services versus the automobile. I've got three examples here. We have more in the report, and I'll just mention the first one uh, in, in particular, which is from Wesley Chapel to downtown Tampa. Um, it can be done by transit on the 275 LX operated by Hart. It takes a, basically an hour or less, slightly more. Um, and then also if you do that by automobile, assuming there are no incidents, that's 30 to 35 minute drive. So clearly there's still a significant advantage by the automobile, largely because the service is in mixed traffic. It doesn't have its own lane to, to expedite the trip. And the same goes true with some of the more extreme examples. If you can make it by regional trip, it takes a long time to get there by regional transit. So this is what we've been working on and we have spent some time with the with each of the local transit agencies or in the case of Hernando we've met with with the MPO and Nina so that's something that you could get your feedback on as well mm -hmm. um, but what this does we're trying to put together in our minds a regional transit vision network from which we would then develop projects and ultimately put together priorities on those projects for the regional TDP so what this vision map shows right now and I'll just highlight through the legend what it's currently showing. First of all, you see the pinkish color. I'm not sure what color that is on that screen, but that's the regional rapid transit project that TBARTA is pursuing, the pd and &E study that's going on right now. So I highlighted that separately so you could clearly see that that's a project that is going forward with, with pd and &E. The green lines show other potential future regional rapid transit corridors. And then the orange lines reflect the express bus or limited stop services that are either operating some today or expected or potentially in the future. And then we've also identified the passenger ferry services that are being looked at and hopefully implemented, as well as we've identified the existing regional rail corridors. They're on the map. We haven't identified if there'd be transit service on those necessarily, but we put them on the map as potential future corridors. I guess the last thing I'll mention is the, the, the text box down to the left talks about types of services that aren't specific to a individual corridors. They include regional paratransit improvements, connect, doing a better job of connecting transit services for transportation disadvantaged. And then the other one relates to the commuter services that are operated by TBARTA, provided by TBARTA, and could be expanded in the future. So this is where we are right now uh, in terms of developing a vision that we that we pull back from to develop the 10-year transit development plan for the region. So obviously something that you all need to take a closer look at and let us know if you have any questions. We'd be glad to discuss that today as well. So as I said, we have a, a regional vision network we're working toward. It's a draft network. Our job will be to identify projects that progress towards that vision and we need to make sure those projects are short-term and long-term. So largely the short-term projects will be related to improvements to the existing services that are out there today, uh, more frequent service or perhaps weekend service on the existing routes in the regional network. Long-term relates more to new routes that aren't being operated today, as well as the regional rapid transit routes would be considered in the long-term as well. So those are just some examples of what those projects will likely turn out to be based on that vision network. Any questions about the, the regional transit vision network at this point? Uh, you're not just focusing on fixture stuff. You're not really looking at the uh, paratransit CTD, right? Well, we did, and, that, and I'll go back to that. We did point out the importance of, in that text box down on the lower left that we do Basically, in response to one of your comments, Kurt, was making sure we as, as a region consider regional connections for transportation disadvantaged. Okay, but the focus is, is mostly on regional fixture with the paratransit supporting that, correct? Sure, absolutely. Thanks. Anybody else? Okay, the next item is the peer region analysis, regional agency analysis that we've conducted, and this is critical to our discussions with the board. I'm gonna talk a lot about what we're gonna do with the board later this month in terms of a presentation. And then we're planning a workshop with the board in November 
that will be sitting down in more detailed workshop settings to, to talk about questions that need to be answered for the roles and responsibilities of TVARTA moving forward. I think you've seen this particular diagram before. It's basically the process we use to identify some peer regional agencies around the country from which we could learn from in our discussions for TVARTA. We use those six focus areas that are indicated on this slide to help us narrow the focus of regional agencies that had applicability to Tampa Bay. And we've narrowed that focus from 20 that we started with to six specific regional entities around the country. And they are, on this one, Atlanta, Minneapolis, Seattle, San Diego, Phoenix, and we also wanted one in Florida, so we have the South Florida Regional Transportation Authority. So basically, we did a case study, and I have two of our other team members here today. Diane Jones is here taking good notes for me so that I don't forget anything you guys have said. And then Andrea Ostraka is from Lochner, who did a lot of work on this peer assessment. So she's here to help me answer any questions you might have as well. I do have one question. How many of those um, uh, partners have two large-scale transit systems inside of them? Well, I know that I would probably say Seattle has how many? Yeah. Or Liz could answer that. They have three. Three. Um, and then maybe San Diego has multiple as well. Also three. Also three. Atlanta's a little different. They have, of course, MARTA, and they have some smaller ones all around. So I think there's good examples to, to draw from. What this shows right here is the uh, there's the six entities across uh, across the, the uh, or down the list there, including TBARTA, and it shows which of them has particular interesting things about that particular approach that we want to at least look at for Tampa Bay. So some of the things we observed in terms of the trends that we learned from those six peer examples are their the TBARTA roles and responsibilities involve funding. They do all involve uh, planning at the regional level. They involve regional transit services, uh, not so much local transit services, limited involvement in that, and then also involvement in regional branding and regional collaboration for working towards what would be perceived as a seamless system across the region. So those are some trends that we observed and served as the basis for when we went forward with the case studies. So in the end, we come up with with four categories. And I'll tell you what our approach is in working with TBARTA staff with the board. So what I'm gonna do later this month on the 27th is make an information and educational presentation to the TBARTA board. I'm gonna give them a lot of information, start identifying the questions that we will want them to be discussing and helping us to answer at the workshop in November so that they have some information to chew on for a couple of months. And then when we sit down in November in a workshop setting, we will guide them through a series of questions. We will talk about the solutions that other regional entities around the country have used to give them the opportunity to then discuss what do they think is applicable for us here in the Tampa Bay area. And the four main categories that we identified through all of these case study analysis relates to planning, funding, operations, and image. So those are the four categories in which we were developing questions for them to, to work through at the workshop. And the bottom line is that regardless of the region, there may be some differences in varying roles from region to region, but the most important thing is for those roles and responsibilities to be clearly specified. So there's no uh, confusion about what the role of TBARTA is, what the role of each of the agencies in the area are, to make sure that we, we have that on in a formal agreement is what we're going to talk about. So the first one here is planning. I have a slide for each one of those. And if you look, I mean, the bottom line is we need to talk about what TBARTA's role will be in capital planning, in, in to some extent service standards, in vision planning. What is the difference of, of the regional TDP with the local TDPs? How do they relate and formalize exactly what TBARTA's role is in the planning process? So I'm not gonna answer those questions in the presentation today. We can talk about, right, really today I'm focusing on the types of questions that we're gonna be reviewing with the board 
in November. And I think what the opportunity is, and David and I talked about this a week or so ago, that we could come back to the to this group in November before the November the, the board meeting in November and have a similar discussion with this group about the kinds of questions that we're going to be asking the board. So I will want to work harder to get everybody in the same room and even those that are on the phone today, we'd like to get them here in person for that next meeting. So the next one is funding. This is the challenging one. Um, the, the fact of the matter is, if t -Barta were to be able to bring new funding for regional transit to the table, this whole process would be very simple. They would be increasing the pie. And that is our ultimate goal. If we could achieve that, this makes us a lot easier because they would be funding services that couldn't be funded prior to that. So that's our goal, but in the process of doing that, we need to understand how other communities have done it around the country, what their involvement has been in oversight of any federal and state funding, what their involvement is in helping define where those resources are going. So there's a number of questions that we're working on that will facilitate that discussion as well. This, by the way, this table shows the current operating and capital budgets for each of the peers as well as t for 2019. And I, I recognize that t 2020 budget is quite a bit higher than what they have there as well. I believe the operating budget is 7.5 million from what I saw uh, or heard from the staff here recently. Um, I actually have a question. Uh -huh. Nicole McCleary sitting in for Chris Cochran. Um, I just wanted to know, so of those entities, are any of them serving the same size that t serves? Population wise? That's, uh, that information is actually included in the, in the report that I recognize we only provided you a link to it yesterday, so I wouldn't have expected anybody to read it. But that's part of it is these are larger metropolitan areas. A, I'll give an example. In Atlanta, we're talking about 13 counties. Um, I believe there's 10 transit operators. So they're a little larger than what we're talking about here, but they're, they're struggling with the same issues and challenges that we're struggling with. So there's a lot to be learned from them. They, generally, they are larger metropolitan areas than we are today, which is what we're aspiring to in our vision too. Thank you. Any questions about funding? The next one is operations. <clears throat> so what we're talking about here is what involvement would T-Bar to have in directly operating, contracting, contracting with local providers, contracting with private operators, answering all those questions and showing examples of how other regional entities are handling the operations of services. For example, in Atlanta, historically, they have operated regional express bus services, but they have not gotten involved in any other types of, of, of local or regional services beyond those regional express bus routes. So we'll provide examples of, of what others are doing. And the bottom line is when, when we look at uh, all of their examples, it's funny because we see that they look like they've had very successful uh, regional entities throughout the country, but they're also, it's a challenge for them as well. They have the same sensitivities that we have here between local operators and a regional entity. So we, we want to just show the benefit that they see that's worth overcoming these sensitivities. And then the last one is image, and that really relates to regional brand, the perception of that seamless service regardless of where the county boundaries exist, and is what can be done by t -Barta to help move in the direction of achieving that. And, it, and it's a bal delicate balance between that local identity and a regional identity and how we bring those two together to show that we're working together. And that's true for the identity itself, as well as for regional fair, regional collaboration on all projects that impact services that are provided regionally. Well, those are the four key areas that we're going to focus on with the preparation for the presentation that later this month to the board and then that workshop in November. Bottom line is, and I kind of started talking about that already, is, is when we talk to each of these regional entities, they strongly believe that there are significant benefits to having this regional entity to support their pursuit of, of opportunities in that region. Uh, better together is what we, is kind of what we coined it in the, in the report itself. Um, however, 
they also recognize they're dealing with the same sensitivities that we are here in Tampa Bay area and that the constant challenge is to balance the, the benefits that we get from a regional approach with ensuring that there's local autonomy with the local services that are being provided. So bringing those two together is the challenge that we have in working with the board. Hey Bill, yes. are uh, any of these regional entities that you're looking at, do they, are they running a service on top of a local service? Well, I, I think the I'm one example, on there, of, I mean, there may be others, but the one I'll mention first of all is, is the ATL is, is poised to take over what Greta was operating, which is the regional express bus services. So they take on that and directly, uh, well, they, they contract for providing those services. Um, and they connect to all of the other local services within each of the counties. So are they so are they, they running it or are they, uh, or are they contracting? They're contracting. Contracting with ATL Atlanta? Yep. Thanks. Did you have other examples, Andrea? Um, there. Sure. The, yeah, the Andrea Ostratko with Lochner. Um, Valley Metro in Phoenix and um, the Metropolitan Council in Minneapolis, St. Paul, they both operate some local service. Um, but that is by virtue of the way that they're organized. For example, Metropolitan Council in Minneapolis, St. Paul covers almost everything in the region. They, they not just cover transportation and transit, they cover parks and affordable housing and, and all sorts of services in the community. So that, um, so while they do offer some local service, I would say that generally the peers um, mostly focus on regional service, meaning services that cross county or city lines when they talk about operations. Okay, so um, Phoenix, you mentioned Phoenix. Do they also run parks and all that other stuff in addition no, to the no. service? No, no. Okay. All of the agencies with the exception of Metropolitan Council in Minneapolis are exclusive to transit. Okay. So the over and over again, when we talk to each of these regional entities on the last uh, bullet there, you see two key benefits that, that we think is important to educate the board on is the ability to leverage resources that we currently have and could potentially get more, and then secondly, just make the region com more competitive economically as we move forward when we're competing with these same entities that we have as case studies, we're competing with them around the country for funding to come to this area. So working together as a region, in the end, is gonna bring more resources to this, to this region. We did wanna just emphasize that we did go back and take a look at the guiding principles that the board adopted uh, the T-Bar to board, and just to reinforce that everything that we're hearing makes sense given the guiding principles that were provided here. And everything that we're saying about balancing the regional emphasis with the local autonomy is consistent with exactly what these guiding principles say. And uh, we'll want to remind the board of that as well. Okay, so we do have some high level recommended actions that we're talking about here. Uh, and it kind of sums, is a summation of some of the things I've already said. But, but number one is clearly defining the roles and responsibilities of TBARTA so that there's no question about that on TBARTA's end as well as any of the local agencies and DOT for that matter as part of this process. The second one is continuing to work on relationships between TBARTA, the local operators, between TBARTA and District 1 and District 7 and making sure that you're continuing to build and strengthen those relationships uh, so that we can build a region that, that can capture the benefits that I was talking about in the previous slides. <coughs> and then the third one relates largely to formalizing those roles and responsibility. For example, in Phoenix, they do an excellent job of formalizing an interlocal agreement that clearly says on paper who's responsible for what, so there's no question about it. Something that we should be working toward in this situation as well. And then finally, it's, it's your ties to the communities. And I think Phoenix is one. In, in four of the six examples, there's a, some type of oversight committee that's involved with 
helping to review the plans and programs of the regional entity to give a voice to the local agencies and the local community that, that we are striking that balance between regional focus and local autonomy. So that was pretty common amongst all of them as, all of them as well. Those are the four high level recommendations at this point. And then will again be a basis of, of the presentation later this month. Any questions about it? Now's the time to, for you to have impact on what we present to the board as on September 27th. And then we, we, we do need to formalize the agenda for the workshop in November fairly soon as well. Okay, we also put together a trend analysis to evaluate the performance of the region's transit services from 2014 to 2018. You'll see on that table the traditional performance measures that we look at when we're evaluating transit performance. We put together the trends for the individual agencies and we also showed a combined aggregated number for the region. And one example I've included here is the trend in ridership for passenger trips. And you can see on the right there is the ridership trend for the region as a whole. And it's gone from about 32 million in 2014 to about 26 million in 2018, about 18% decline. Um, again, these trends are pretty similar to Florida as a whole and in most of what we're seeing around the country. Hopefully we're getting to the point where that seems to be stabilizing and we're ready to, to move that in the other direction. But you can also see the individual tra transit agency trends here in ridership as well as Florida uh, as a whole. Um, so we've done this for each of the measures that we've, in the report, we've had this for each of the measures so you can see aggregate performance and individual transit operating performance as well. Is this both fixed route and paratransit? This is just the fixed route. So when you get a chance to look at that in greater detail, again, we welcome comments on that. And we recognize this is through 2018. We haven't shown 2019. And I hope, and everything I've been hearing is that the numbers are looking better than, than this trend would suggest. So we'll, we'll, before I present to the board at the end of, this, of September, I would like to, to get some feedback on that trend in the, in the, in the coming year so that I can at least have some caveats to, to the trend. Okay, these were, I did wanna, when I go to the board, I wanna make sure we have some discussion of the explanation for the ridership decline. So these are the three items I was gonna focus on. Again, I welcome your thoughts on whether there's other sites should include, but the strong economy certainly has been one that's had a big impact on transit. The transportation network companies have taken some of the ridership away from transit. And then finally, the, there has been an increase in people working from home. So there are three trends right there that have contributed to the decline that we've seen over the last several years. But again, if you have anecdotal information that will allow me to show that that's starting to change, which I understand is the case, I would welcome that as well. Hey, Bill, one question. Uh, the number of jobs available in the transportation, because as you know, we'll know, we draw uh, a lot of our systems to um, some of the lower income jobs, uh, introductory jobs type of thing. Uh -huh. Do you do any, uh, do you have any data on that compared to the transit? Uh, either transit dependent riders is what I'm looking for. Well, the analysis that we're doing now for, basically we're doing the, the transit demand assessment now yeah. includes that. So it isn't in the report that's out there now, but it will be. Because one of the things we were kind of looking at is that is increasing for us, but we're also having a lot of uh, growth for Pasco, and I'm sure Hernando's also seeing the same way. So I was just curious if that saw, has any impact on the ridership. Well, we should be showing that when we look at the, the future demographics and the, and the densities that are coming with that. So there, there, that analysis will come in future presentations. Excellent. Just a quick summary of the table. Basically, we took all of the measures that, that we put together. We reflected the desired trend that we'd like to see and the actual trend. So if you see an arrow that's red, then it's going in the opposite direction of what we would like it to be. So there's a lot of red there, largely because of the ridership declines. So most of those red measures are coming up because ridership is part of that particular performance measure. 
So uh, if we can uh, get the ridership back on track, then this will certainly help the measures that we show here as going in the opposite direction that we'd like to see them go. I did want to give you a quick update on, we did have a, a, a good online survey as part of phase one public outreach. We do plan a second one uh, using MetroQuest, which the MPOs have been using here in the region lately as well. The purpose of our MetroQuest survey this time is to basically get feedback from the public on priorities for improving regional transit service. So we're gonna identify some opportunities, get their feedback on it, and use that as one of our criteria in the evaluation of and prioritization of regional projects. Um, that's plan, we're working on finalizing that now, but it wouldn't go live until October 1st. That's, that's why we'd like to get it out there and have it out there for two months. And I think we've timed it pretty well to be not going on at the same time as the other MPOs are having those similar types of surveys. And then this is the results of our phase one public outreach. We, we have reached more than 23,000 people as part of the outreach uh, through these techniques shown on this table. Uh, a good portion of that was through social media outreach, uh, but we do feel pretty good about the amount of uh, outreach and input that we received so far. So as we stand right now, our next steps are largely to focus on the two highlighted in yellow, which is the, this important presentation to the board later this month that will give them information out of this presentation. We really welcome any feedback there that might impact how we present this information to the board. And then the bottom one, which is that workshop with the board in November. That's gonna be a critical point in this whole project to determine if we can get this headed in a direction where we can more clearly define the role of TBARTA here in the Tampa Bay region. The other items on this slide are progress we're making on documentation for various elements of our analysis. We're continuing to work on them. Again, you have the, the draft report in the, uh, in the uh, agenda packet that you received yesterday along with this presentation. So I welcome any comments from you or give us a call if you want to discuss it any further. With that, I'll be glad to answer any additional questions. Can you go back to the slide before that one, the one before? I see that the website, no, oh, which this one? Skip. yeah, that one. Website comment forms only 85, so you just received 85 comments? That's where they went out. into the website and, and actually put in the, in the general comment field? Yeah. Not through the surveys, we got. Yeah, but those are throughout all the agencies? No, I this, mean, this was the general input only from for, the public. Okay. From the public. So most of this is the, the general public outreach. And that's an agency could have put in comments too, but largely this was the citizens and the general public. Okay. Well, no, I was just wondering where this this survey was, where where was it placed for people to be able to because I haven't seen it. So uh, is that so something this has that been done for some some time? No, is that something that we can put in our website to help right, to right. capture? You know, people sometimes go on our website to look well, at routes or. Dina, you know, right, we'll do that next time because we definitely did mm -hmm. it with the MPO last time. Mm -hmm. And, he, and Steve Diaz did a distribution from there, so I'm surprised you didn't see it. So we'll definitely make yeah. sure you get mm -hmm. it next time Yeah, as well. that's, we can do anything to help to you know, sure. promote and to spread the I, word. I appreciate that, because we did mm -hmm. have some trouble getting some input from Fernando. That's fine. We yeah. tried to track it by zip code so we could see what input we were getting from each county. And, mm -hmm. and Steve Arta staff did a nice job of doing some advertising on Facebook and other websites mm -hmm. to increase Yes, the yes, contact me because I can put on our uh, the county face, Facebook oh. page and they can spread the word out and all that. So we can definitely do We'll be, be sure to do that next mm -hmm. time. Anybody else? Again, I encourage you to look at the report and this presentation. Give us any feedback that you have before we present to the t board on the 27th. And, and then after that, preparing for that important workshop that I would encourage all of you to get on your calendars for November 15th, I believe it is. Is that correct, Jim? I don't know if that's been finalized yet. But okay. Um, we'll get you that information, but uh, observing that discussion will be an important step as well, if, if we could get you all there to attend as well. Thank you very much. Can I ask just one sure. final question, just on behalf of the MPOs? Um, when, when you're completed with the Regional Transit Development Plan, what role do you envision the MPOs have in accepting or endorsing or incorporating any of these recommendations into their plans and priorities 
project is. I'm not sure we've answered that yet. We want, we would love for the MPOs to integrate the plan. And if that is, if there's a way of proceeding with that, maybe we discuss with the MPO staff directors an opportunity to present that either to the CCC or to each of the MPO boards separately. Uh, how we do that, we're certainly willing to sit down and talk about talk about that with you and see the best way to approach it. Because of course we would love for the regional TDB to be uh, integrated into your long range planning process as, as part of the first 10 years. Okay, I, I ask because we're all adopting them. Um, You're gonna be earlier before them. us. Well, some are this, this, this November, December, and then I guess the next batch would be a year from now. Right. So it's possible that when you're done, you'll be ready for Sarasota and Fulton. On their schedules. And we right. can then come back and amend if need be. But I guess so, I'd like to make sure that we have some kind of alignment between what your long range planning activities are for transportation in general and how we've got maybe more of a shorter term, 10 year horizon. But as far as specifically deciding what that process is, we should talk at a future MPO sure. staff directors yeah. meeting yeah. about that. And I will say that we, when we put together the initial draft regional transit vision network, we basically used the, re the regional transit feasibility plan and the MPO's long range transportation plans that were available at that time. Okay. And which may, have cha may be changing some for their adoption. So I guess when we have our plans adopted in November, Will there be an opportunity to just sort of it should do be. A, a check? It should be, because we want to be, since we're after that, we, we want to be consistent with it as well. And that's really a requirement anyway, but it's, that's good planning and, and a requirement. Okay. Anybody else? <coughs> Bless you. Thank you again. And uh, next uh, thing is, uh, Bob's going to give us something on the uh, pre presentation on the Central Avenue BRT project. Thank you. Use the arrows. Use the arrows. Okay. Good afternoon, Bob Lasher, External Affairs, Pinal Sun Coast Transit Authority. I'm going to take you through uh, just a quick overview of our bus rapid transit project. And uh, I'm gonna try to keep it upper level because I know that when other people and other agencies start getting down to the street level at this street, that avenue in other counties, I can't always follow along. So I'm gonna try not to do that for you today. Uh, how do I bring, you got it up there, very good. Okay, this, uh, as you may know, is one of the first legs, we hope, of the regional system. This is a map very similar to what Bill had up earlier, although his was in pink and I thought much better looking than ours, so I'm gonna move on. The actual uh, routing will go from the bay to the beach, downtown St. Petersburg. Uh, if you're familiar with that, we've got an area down there by USF, Johns Hopkins, we've got the medical centers in that area across one of the main large thoroughfares that has three lanes of traffic going each direction, uh, First Avenues, North and South, then on out to our beaches in St. Pete Beach. And once you get out to those beaches, what you're seeing here is the route narrows down into two lanes either way. And uh, as you'll see as we move forward, we hope to have exclusive lanes on First Avenues, North and South, the major ones, but not on those uh, that only have two lanes going each direction. Some of the uh, areas and employees will serve, uh, USF, the medical centers, uh, we've got a lot of museums, our performing arts centers, the major tourist destinations out on St. Peach, and uh, our major uh, transfer area now, which is called Grand Central Station, where people will be able to link up to a large portion of our routes going all across the county. It's a 20 mile round trip route. We've got 30 stations, uh, 16 pairs, and then the ends. Uh, with level boarding, so they will be 14 inches high on the platforms, people will be able to walk or roll right on. Uh, frequency every 15 minutes during the day, and then once we move into the evening hours, every 30 minutes from 6 a.m. until midnight. This should reduce the end-to-end -end travel time between St. Pete and the beaches by about uh, 30 to 35 percent. And right now that runs about 55 minutes. We have a Central Avenue trolley that runs that route. 
uh, number of jobs within half a mile are 25,000, and then the number of people uh, within half a mile of the corridor is nearly 50,000. We have uh, transit signal priority we'll put in, and then the payment considerations will be off board fare uh, payment, tap on media, have some uh, card readers, uh, credit card readers at the stations, and the stations have varying levels. The idea is to be able to board and alight all doors to speed things up and get the system moving along. As I mentioned before, we do have uh, current service along that route that does run on Central Avenue. Uh, you may hear this referred to as the Central Avenue BRT. That's only been a working name. We will have a branding coming up in the next few months. It'll be called something else because it doesn't run on Central Avenue. But right now, our current uh, daily ridership is 2,400. The corridor is 5,800 a day with the other routes and the projected BRT. Uh, this is after three different studies is about 4,000 a day. We will have the buses restricted to using the right-hand lane of uh, an avenue along the beaches once it gets into where we have two lanes each direction only. Uh, when we're moving on those uh, corridors that I mentioned earlier that have three lanes each direction, we will actually be taking the left lane. These buses will be traveling in the left lane because it's closest to the Central Avenue. So people will be able to get off of these at island stations then make a quick cross. They don't have to cross three lanes of traffic, but they'll be easily able to get off and move toward the Central Avenue, which is the target corridor, which has most of the businesses. Uh, we will not be taking, and I, I can't emphasize this enough, a lane for the buses anywhere where there are only two lanes of traffic each direction. That has kind of caught fire, and we're having trouble putting that one out. And here's an example of, of the type of station we'll have. Uh, the lane is not exclusive to buses. The lane will be used by buses, by cars that are turning, if they're having to decelerate or accelerate into traffic, uh, and of course, emergency vehicles, and then they'll be open if we have any sort of evacuations. And as you look at these, uh, we usually get asked, well, if a car is coming out from the left, where you see here, and then they have to make that left turn, they can use the bus lane. They don't have to pull around the station. And of course, the stations will have fencing, uh, bollards, uh, lots of uh, protection there for the actual riders and, to keep, and traffic warnings too, to keep people in the proper lane. This is an example of some of the stop elements. Uh, we have several levels of stops. Some may just be the totem uh, with some of the bollards. Some may have a mixture of the bench the uh, lighted signs or the arrival signs as well uh, depends upon how much what the ridership and the band is for at each stop. Configuration of the buses was just recently decided a 40 foot diesel electric hybrids with uh, four capacity bikes. We can go more bikes, but then that will take out seats. So the seating, depending upon the wheelchairs, will be anywhere from 23 to 31. And that should end up being about $2 million less than the original 60-foot articulated buses that would be a plan. Right now, the uh, project cost is uh, about $44 million with FTA, FDOT, the City of St. Petersburg, and PSDA um, chipping into that. In fact, we have uh, a group going up to the FDA in New Washington just next week to work with them to keep the project on track and to get our CIG grant funding. And I like to put this in because so many people here can commiserate. Some of the community misperceptions uh, that we're seeing is uh, the bus rapid transit lanes the, will cause severe congestion. And somehow, by putting this in, we'll multiply the number of cars on the road. I'm not sure how that comes about, but that's one we've been fighting about. Uh, a lot of people are convinced that we will be taking an exclusive lane on the areas where there are only two lanes each direction. So that's another one we're battling. We are not going to do that. Um, they say that the buses already run empty, and I can tell you we were riding out at 7.30 in the morning on our Central Avenue trolley, and there were 52 people on that bus from once we got to the beaches, heading south, and then getting off. Um, doesn't, that doesn't seem empty to me. Uh, this, one, uh, this one's one of my favorites. Increased transit will kill tourism. That's actually been said, I, and multiple times. I don't know why, I don't know where it comes from. Uh, and then the buses are going to be everywhere and they're gonna be blocking traffic. Well, we're already running buses in all these quarters right now, and not at all. In fact, when you look at it, you're gonna have uh, six buses over 20 miles. It's, that's a pretty good spread between buses. That's a peak hour. 
And then, uh, interestingly, they'll think it makes it uh, going to make it more dangerous. And studies actually show quite the opposite. Uh, they're worried about pedestrians and uh, bicycles. Very few reports of any sort of incidents there. Typically, the reports we get out on those corridors are texting and driving, not looking up in time and catching us in the, the back. And we're just at the end of the design. In fact, we just finished our 60% uh, design. We will have our first public workshop on that tomorrow in uh, St. Pete, I'm sorry, South Pasadena. And I'll have the address up here in a minute. You are welcome to come enjoy the fire. I mean, see the, uh, see the new presentation. Uh, and we have made a lot of changes. We went out at 30%. We did listen. We've moved the stations. The buses have been shortened. Uh, we've changed station amenities, changed the routing. So we did listen and we did make a lot of changes. And we're, we're anxious to bring that forward tomorrow. I uh, hope to have 100% uh, design by the end of 2019. And also, I think they're hoping within the next few months to announce the actual name of the project. Uh, and then we have been working with Ford Pinellas to coordinate uh, a TOD planning grant that we got along with the city of St. Pete and members of cities along the way that will help us uh, do business assistance, station planning, uh, and implementation strategies and move forward. So we hope to have this up and running by 2021. And as I mentioned, the open houses tomorrow evening, uh, South Pasadena City Hall, six o'clock. And then we will also have one before our board meeting this month, which is an evening board meeting, September 25th. So we'll have the open house and the board set up in our, our uh, foyer from five o'clock to 6 p.m. before our meeting. And that's the presentation. Any questions? And I'm going to take a chance to thank Witt, who is here from Ford Pinellas, because he and uh, Barry Burton, our county administrator, have been making the rounds, trying to drum up more transportation funding. And that's transportation all around in Pinellas County. And we certainly hope them the best. And thank you. Thanks, Tom. Now it looks like uh, Brian's going to give us uh, some PD and E project updates from Tubarga. Yeah, good afternoon. I'm Brian Pissarro with Tubarga. Um, I know there's two people here that have heard this presentation before. Three if Ben comes back in. So apologies for having to sit through the rerun. Um, the PD and E study for the Catalyst BRT has been underway since May. Um, the goal is to have it done within 28 months. So that would put us at late summer of 2021. Uh, when the pd &E study is complete, we will have accomplished four things. We will have completed the environmental review. We'll have 30% of the design done. We'll have the locally preferred alternative adopted into the LRTPs for the three counties. And we'll have enough information to put together to send off the FTA so that it, they can evaluate it for either new starts or small starts. Where we are right now in the study is we're focused on the BRT stations. The regional transit feasibility study from which the Catalyst BRT project originated, identified 21 station locations. We're taking a closer look at those to see if we need to refine the number and the locations. We've had a meeting of the station's working group, which is composed of both MPO and land use planning staff from the three counties. Uh, in October, we're gonna have a meeting of the business partners working group to get their feedback. This is a group composed of members from the private business community. Um, once we nail down the number and location of the stations, then we can shift gears and look into the design of the stations and start talking about ingress and egress from the stations. Other things that have been going on, obviously a lot of data collection. WSP, our consultant, has done uh, drone surveys of the entire corridor. Uh, last week, we launched the website for the project study. Uh, includes an interactive map where people can go and leave comments um, on specific um, locations along the route that they have a comment about. And the website also includes uh, the beginning of um, an inf informational video on the project. And we're going to be adding to this video as the project moves along and we know more information about it. So that's what I have. Thank you. Um, on the, any type of web-based uh, stuff you have, I think every agency here would love to have you send us your link so we can actually put it on our uh, social media sites too and hopefully get more people 
involved in your surveys and studies and so forth like that. Sure, will do. Brian, uh, we were talking about reevaluating the stations 21. Do you expect the number to go up or down? Or if anything, I would expect it to go down. Okay. Thanks. Any questions for Brian? Thank you, sir. Okay. Um, that brings us to uh, the committee round robin, and we'll go ahead and start with the bus. You want to go ahead and uh, <laughs> just because you're on this side, and then I looked up, and there you were. Well, so go right ahead if you want to start. Let's walk around. And well, just an update. Um, last uh, two weeks ago, it was approved for us to extend uh, our service hours Monday through Friday. Right now, um, we serve um, around 5:30 to 7 o'clock, so we will be extending it to 9 o'clock, and also Saturday services from 5 in the morning till 7 o'clock at night. So that's a big improvement for us. So that's it so far. Um, I'm sitting in for Chris today and did not know that I was sitting in for Chris today. So I have nothing to report. Yes. Just so you know, I didn't know I was going to be a uh, chair. <laughs> <laughs> I'm with you. We'll, we'll blame Chris for no matter yeah. what happens. <laughs> and I noticed your boss kind of snuck out really quick. Yes. Too, <laughs> so you don't really have anything right now? Not That's right fine. now. If, if something comes back in, we'll might, I'll hit him up. Yes. Um, talking about PS, uh, PCPT. Um, we put in for a grant for regional uh, transportation, uh, basically providing door-to-door -door service from Pasco County to the West Shore and the USF area. I keep saying FSU and they keep telling me that's in the wrong city. <laughs> um, so you know I'm not really from Florida. Uh, so um, that should be coming out soon. I know there are some issues with the CTD on that, but we're real um, positive that we're actually going to get that and be able to provide that service and this is a pilot project right now but if it expands as well as we think it is based on the number of phone calls I get from customers asking me why aren't you doing this I think it's going to be a very um, beneficial program right in line with the regional studies going on and it's more for the people that are encountering barriers to get to the fixed street system although we'll initially be transporting just about anybody who meets the Commission for Transportation Disadvantage. The big thing we're looking at is the jobs that can be people can now get to that they wouldn't be able to get to previously, uh, specifically in the West Shore or the USF area. So that's our big uh, thing right now. And hopefully uh, in the next month or so, we'll have some good news by the next meeting that we actually did get the grant and are we moving forward. Is that a state grant? Uh, CTD, uh, Commission for Transportation oh, yeah, Advantage. Right. No, PSDA, the big one is our, our BRT project, and then uh, up next week, hoping to move along the allocation agreement on the CIG uh, up in Washington. Other than that, uh, Bill, our ridership year-to-date is up 1.5%, and the year closes out at the end of the month. So we're hoping it holds steady, and it, it has been. So there's some good news there. Uh, we have now six electric buses, and depending upon what happens with the BP monies, we should be getting more. We're also looking for some help. Uh, with funding for charging stations there, and then of course the the work that we're doing with Wit and Barry Burton to try to increase transportation funding, of which uh, we'll be part of in Pinellas, is a big deal. Um, uh, that's oh, and we have a couple of AB projects, uh, pilot projects we're working on. One in St. Petersburg. I know they're looking at Dunedin for another one and considering a third, and uh, those are just ongoing at this point. Demonstration projects. We have no other updates. We, we shared <laughs> everything we had. You already everything you got. Go for it. Okay, sir, if you'd like to. Sure. Go ahead. Uh, from Pinellas, well, um, Bob kind of gave me a, an intro. I'd like to talk about what we are doing uh, to look at funding for transportation. And um, we've identified a series of what we're calling investment corridors as a strategy to link uh, workforce uh, development with uh, affordable housing and to have transit be that connector that so uh, we've identified three priority investment corridors that are all us 19 between st petersburg central avenue and downtown clearwater uh, running through largo and uh, seminole uh, roosevelt east bay which would be an east-west route that would travel from largo through to the gateway and mid-county area the mobile center that's planned in that area and the third quarter is 34th street south from the skyway main district in south st petersburg 
up through um, to about the St. Jude College Drew Street campus in Clearwater. Uh, there are other corridors we've identified, but um, I, I was asked to come up with the top three. And these are all, they, they touch the um, affordable housing areas, opportunity zones, community development agencies, uh, and we think they have a significant bang for the buck for limited stop express transit in these corridors. Uh, we have money for uh, Penny for Pinellas that is off the top for affordable housing and economic development. And there is a joint review committee that's establishing criteria for where to spend those dollars. And the first tier for how to spend those dollars would be in these investment corridors. So there's a nice alignment uh, of those goals. Uh, we are looking at a potential referendum in 2020 uh, to take to the voters for either a half cent or potentially a full cent sales tax for uh, congestion relief, safety, and transit, and these investment quarters would be a part of that, along with some other complementary feeder routes for PSCA, uh, and to maintain current service levels at their, at their basic level. Um, so all these things together, there's a lot of flexibility, it's still fluid, but we're gonna be bringing this strategy back to the Board of County Commissioners on October 17th for a workshop, and if there's a referendum in Pinellas in 2020, it'll have to be decided by January or February in order to get it on the ballot. So we're, we're looking at that possibility. I've gotten really great feedback from our state legislative delegation, including the most conservative members of our delegation who like the strategy. Um, so I'm encouraged by that. Um, there is gonna be some private polling done to help guide us, and we'll understand that maybe in the next couple of months where that, what's that showing us. Um, so stay tuned. Uh, I think that's a really positive development in Pinellas. Uh, we also recognize that you know if the I-275 PD&E study comes out uh, with um, you know something that's that's positive that we can rally around, then we're going to be having to find resources to operate and maintain that uh, at least a share of it. And so we need to figure out where that's coming from. So there's a lot of things on the horizon that we know we need to be, be better prepared for to support economic development and growth in Pinellas County. Um, so I think that's about it for now. There's a lot going on. Thank you, sir. Well, uh, every year, FDOT uh, and all our districts provide uh, a workshop, transit workshop, for uh, our grant recipients. And uh, in um, District 1, uh, that will be held October 2nd and October 3rd. And the one in October 3rd will be in Fort Myers. Uh, we know Ryan's on the phone and will be there. Uh, and October 2nd, so uh, those are for our existing uh, recipients of uh, 5310, 5311, 5339 grants. You basically go over uh, the application uh, and uh, it's really uh, morphed into uh, not only that, but it's going over uh, the requirements, uh, the, the statute uh, requirements something that we do in District 1. Um, not quite sure when District 7 did. The other thing I wanted to mention was Mobility Week. <clears throat> Have any of you heard of Mobility Week? This week? Uh, no. It's, oh. uh, mobility Week is a, this will be our second year with uh, Mobility Week as FDOT um, is promoting uh, events, uh, trying to make more appearances at events during this week, and we're trying to work with the, all the transit agencies to, to, to have some kind of event uh, to promote um, ridership. Um, what week is this? Just curiosity, what week is this happening? It's the last week in October. Thank you. <coughs> and um, it doesn't have to be during that week. I mean, it could be the week before, the week after. You know, we're pretty flexible. We're going to put it on uh, our, uh, the state website promote any of your events and then if you if you would like to have uh, and I'll just speak for district one uh, uh, FDOT to be down there with a tent and, and promoting safety and, and uh, alternative modes of transportation uh, you know uh, we're not doing very well uh, in the safety area in the state of Florida uh, and uh, so this is just another FDOT effort to um, get the 
So we would like to, uh, you know, really, uh, really push your participation in, in, in this in any way that you can. Uh, we'd like to work with you. That does tie into the community planning month that right. the American Planning Association recognizes. So yeah, yeah. yeah and this is very important. This is something that's going to. It's always going to be the last. Second year, we're just starting with this, so hopefully, through the year, we can do a bigger and better every time. So, thank you for that. That's all I got. Um, Kurt? Yes, ma'am. Um, I'd actually like to share a little bit. Sorry, I thought you were speaking specific to ridership. So, some things going on at CART is that we are presenting to our board um, next week our transit development plan. We're also presenting our IOC for approval from the board. Um, last week, Mr. Lerner presented um, the, the state tax um, funding to the Board of County Commissioners, and it was supported there where they will provide some funding if litigation continues on. So just wanted to share those things. Um, we do have some uh, request for proposals out. Well, that will be coming out shortly. So um, I don't know how much I can talk about that, but there are two, right? So um, not a lot, <laughs> <laughs> right? So, um, but those will be hitting uh, the streets shortly. So you know, look out for those things. And I think that's a good summary for right now. Thanks a lot. On your transportation, when you say the last full, is it the last full week of October or the last week of October? Because uh, it's either 21st or 28th. Um, let's see where that is. Yeah, I'm not ready. 25th. 25th through November 1st. Thank you. Okay, so Friday to Friday. To Friday. Okay. Because, I mean, a lot of regional agencies may want to get involved in that just to make sure we got the date down and gives them enough time to start thinking about ideas we can move forward. So, so um, if I may just. Go ahead. Mobility Week FL And we'll take a look at that. If uh, we have nothing else, we'll move on to the old and new business. Anybody have any old or new business? Hearing none, seeing none, I'll take a motion for adjournment. So moved. And a second. Second. Yep. And we are adjourned. Thank you. Next Thank meeting you. is in um, November 11th, if I'm not correctly, but that don't quote me on that. 12. November 12th. November 12th. I was close. Mm -hmm. I was close. At PSTA. Thank you for coming.